Hello, everyone. Welcome and welcome back to my channel. I'm Min. Today, we are going to chat about a wild case that went down in Sydney. So, get this: the victim was a Chinese chick studying abroad, and the killer was her step uncle, who's a white dude. And if you think that was crazy enough, there's actually something even weirder about this whole thing. And since what I'm going to describe is going to be very gross. If you are eating or not in the right mood for something nauseating, please click away. So one day in November 2019, this lady from Sydney visited her mom in the western suburbs like she usually did. And on that day, she saw that her mom was holding this pretty heavy waterproof USB drive. Coated. At first, I thought it was someone's toy, and I didn't know how my mom even got it. She said to the police, "But since her mom had Alzheimer's and couldn't remember where and how the thing was being held in her hands, the lady decided to take the USB drive and check what was inside so she could give it back to its rightful owner. There were nine video files and thirteen pictures. You know, they all shown on this list field." No preview, no thumbnails. So the lady thought to herself that if she watched one or two of those, she'd definitely know who this belongs to, right? You know, could be one of their relatives since her mother was holding this USB drive. But the content of these fast drive frightened her. All of the files were the same theme. Where an Asian young woman was tied all her limbs and lied in the middle of a bed, and there was this white dude puked at her, literally vomiting. The girl was struggling, but like I said, her whole body was restricted, so she couldn't really get away with all of these craps. Then this monster raped her with all this disgusting substance he vomited. I'm sorry, that sounds way too bad. The girl wasn't gagged, so she yelled and begged, and it all recorded within those videos saved to that drive. So the victim struggled intensely. She knocked over the camera towards the end of the videos. As a result, the screen went black for the last ten minutes. However, her screams and all these disturbing noises got recorded in these videos. I guess with this black screen, it all looked too real. Otherwise, the lady who found this USB drive could have treated it as some bad kink. So the lady went straight to the police. The police just confirmed that the woman in the video was Michelle Lung, an international student from Sydney University of Technology, who was brutally killed three years ago. The killer was found guilty for Michelle's murder. But there wasn't enough evidence for a sexual assault trial. The crazy part is, this USB drive contained new evidence surfaced over three years later, in a way like this. Apparently, the old lady who found this evidence had no connection at all to this killer, and given her age and limited mobility, it's a mystery how this fast drive ended up in her possession. Maybe there's some sort of guardian angel, making sure justice is served for the poor girl and the killer's awful crimes are brought to light. On the morning of 24th of April 2016, around 10:30 a.m., a couple reported to the police that they had discovered what appeared to be a body. Wrapped in a plastic bag, floating near a blowhole at Snap Point in Mamre State Conservation, the receiving officers initially thought that this might be another case of drowning, as this place in central New South Wales is known for being a dangerous where eighteen people have drowned in the last eight years. You know, the plastic bags could be some sort of random rubbish that wrapped around the bodies. However, when the police finally brought the floating bag to the land, they realized that the situation was not as innocent as they initially believed. 
The bag was obviously tied on purpose to hold something, instead of looking like random stuff from the water tangled with the floating object. So they opened it and discovered a young Asian woman inside. They discovered that the woman was completely naked and had multiple stab wounds on her body, which just confirmed what they were afraid of. According to the forensics, the deceit had obvious wounds and marks from being bound on her wrists and ankles. There were more than 30 stab wounds on her, and she suffered at all when she was alive. She struggled severely before she passed away, as many of those wounds she had was from when she was trying to defend herself. Even her skull was full of these wounds and marks that indicate extreme violence she must have endured until her last moment. Due to the body being completely immersed in seawater, some biological evidence got washed away and the forensic ex examiner couldn't figure out if the deceit had been sexually assaulted. The time of death was no more than 48 hours, maybe even shorter. There were no signs of any impact with rocks on the victim's body. The police concluded that the blowhole was not the crime scene, and the victim was probably murdered and then dumped there by the culprit. The police compared the reports of missing persons, but they didn't find any matching cases with the victim. On the afternoon of the 24th of April, the Sydney Morning Herald first reported a headline titled, Woman Found Dead at Snapper Point Blow Hole. On the afternoon of the 25th of April, this dude named Derek Barrett who's a white guy, went to the police station in New South Wales to report a missing person case. Barrett is from Sydney locally, but his wife is from Chengdu, China. So according to his wife, they haven't seen their niece Michelle for a few days since the 21st of April, even though they've been trying to call her but couldn't get a hold of her. According to Barrett's wife, Michelle was described as a well-behaved and obedient individual. It was highly unlikely that she would have left home without informing her family for several days. Normally, there can be loads of reasons why a grown-up can't be reached for three to four days, and it doesn't usually cause as much worry as a missing child. But here's the thing, Barry's wife is Michelle's auntie and they've been living together the auntie knows her niece really well, so when she started thinking about the stuff around her niece's disappearance, things didn't seem right. That's why she nudged her husband to go with her and reported it to the police. According to her, Michelle never spent a night away at home before, and if she planned to go anywhere, she would definitely tell her family beforehand. But on the day she disappeared, she just up and left without saying a word. That doesn't sound like her. And April is in a summertime in Australia, so Michelle always rocked a jacket when she went out. But on the day she disappeared, she didn't wear one, which was kind of weird. Well, you can say that because she didn't tell her family about her travel plans or whatever. It seemed like she didn't plan on being away from home for too long. So in that case, she could have a chance to not bring her coat. But the average daily maximum UV index in Senate Australia in April is 6. This indicates a high health risk from unprotected exposure to the sun. Michelle always brought her umbrella everywhere with her, even if it wasn't raining, just to protect herself from the sun. But on the day she disappeared, she went out without an umbrella, which made it seem like, again, she didn't plan on being out for a long time. And since Michelle went missing, her aunt checked her public transportation card records and discovered that it hadn't been used at all. Michelle didn't drive, she might have used any sort of transportation like she usually did, if she ever wanted to travel anywhere but there was no record of her using any of those. So they couldn't just sit and wait any longer for the niece to reappear. 
Based on the description of Michelle given by the reporting lady, the cops thought that the female body found at the blowhole was probably her missing niece. The cops were preparing to take this couple to look at the seed and see if it was really Michelle. At the same time, the police seized some of Michelle's belongings from her residence to conduct a DNA test and compare it with the dead body. While the DNA testing was pending, Derek Barrett and his wife, you know, the couple went to the police, didn't get to recognize the body. However, since the body was fished out from the ocean, it's actually pretty normal not to be able to recognize, even by the family. As fan of crime case like us may already know, after someone dies, a bunch of bacteria can mess with the face and body shapes. Plus, the seawater can erode it and cause some major changes, making it look totally different. So it's not weird at all if the family can't recognize the body, right? Therefore, three days after the seed was discovered. The police released a reconstructed picture of the deceased person to the public in hopes of obtaining information and leads. The woman was believed to be in her late twenties or early thirties, of Asian descent, with shoulder-length hair and approximately 170 centimeters tall. It is unclear how much information they obtained from the post. Another three days later. Their DNA comparison finally yielded a report confirming that the individual in question was indeed Michelle Lung, an international student at the Sydney University of Technology. Michelle Lung was born in 1991 in Chengdu, China, and she went to Yulin Middle School in Chengdu for her secondary education. Right before her college entrance exam, a really bad earthquake caught the 2008 Sichuan earthquake happened, and sadly, Michelle lost her dad. Her friends said that she was super sad, but still managed to cry her way through the college entrance exams and got accepted into Sichuan University's Jincheng College, where she started broadcasting and hosting. In her second year of university, which was 2011. Michelle arrived to Australia for her studies. When she got to Australia, she stayed in an apartment rented by her aunt and her aunt's boyfriend at the time, Barrett. Not long after, Michelle got to see her aunt and Barrett tied the knot. It was a really happy wedding. While her aunt, who was 43, finally married the love of her life, Barrett, who was only 22. Michelle's mom even chipped in. For some of the wedding's expenses, since her mother and her aunt are really close sisters with a tight bond, Michelle Long studied hotel management at the University of Technology, Sydney. She did pretty well in her studies and had plans to work and live in Sydney and its surrounding areas after graduation. When Michelle's mom found out about her plans, She sold one of her properties in China and used the money as a down payment to buy a detached house in Kamsi, which is only 11 kilometers away from the center of Sydney. Kamsi is known for its easy transportation, good public safety, and is a popular choice for many Chinese families to settle down. In April 2014, Michelle's mom traveled to Australia to help her. And her sister's family moved into this new home. In Michelle's mom's mind, it is important for the whole family to live together. So Michelle's aunt's family also moved into the same house. You know, they could take care of each other, especially because Michelle's mother was staying in China most of her time. The mother wanted her sister to keep an eye on her child in Australia. As a result. Michelle, her aunt Barrett, and her aunt's son and daughter from a previous marriage all lived together in this house. Michelle's mom bought. Michelle Lung was such a chilled and down-to-earth person. She had a love for cooking, a passion for fashion, and a keen eye for beauty. 
she frequently shared her makeup tutorial videos on her social media accounts. She was passionate about posting impressive selfies. She documented various aspects of her life in a foreign land, accompanied by a strong longing for her mother and hometown. Just like many people, she was a cheerful, expressive, and likable young girl who enjoyed sharing and expressing herself. When she finally returned to China, she was excited to indulge in the delicious late-night snacks of Chengdu. And thoroughly enjoyed her mother's home cooked meals. She posted all on her social medias, and her relationship with her aunt's family was great. She would always hang out with them during holidays, and you can totally see that in her Instagram posts. In 2015, with her mother's support, her aunt's family even went on a two-week vacation with Michelle in Chengdu, China. Apparently, Michelle's mom had better financial success than her sister, but her sister was also taking care of Michelle in a foreign land for a return. It's a win-win situation. In 2015, Michelle graduated from the University of Technology, Sydney. Then, in 2016, she decided to enroll in a level three translation course at the Sydney Institute of Interpreting and Translation. Probably to earn some points for her skilled independent visa applications, so she could migrate to Sydney or Australia once her accumulated points meet the requirement. This 25-year-old lady was working hard to achieve her dream life. Fast forward to the 19th of April, 2016, when Michelle was strolling in the park, enjoying the perfect afternoon sun and the clear blue sky. She snapped a photo on her phone of a bunch of kids having a blast in a small square. She simply captioned it with two words: "Beautiful day." He told, "Did anyone know that Michelle Lang's promising life would suddenly come to a stop just a few days later?" Upon learning the DNA comparison results, the devastated aunt told the police that. Michelle's disappearance and potential harm were likely related to an Australian boyfriend she had met on Facebook. Quoted, "We saw these photos. He has blonde hair, fair skin, and his eyes look menacing, with an unfriendly appearance. He lives in Wollongong. If this guy did something bad to Michelle, she would definitely resist, and she had never had a boyfriend before." According to her aunt, at the same time, Michelle's cousin in China told reporters that he heard from other friends that Michelle recently met a foreign guy on social media. Quoted, "It was a total surprise, and she didn't tell us the family at all." He said, "I heard that Michelle has been seeing this guy for more than two months, but I don't know if it's related to the case." However, the police didn't find any more information about this alleged boyfriend from Michelle Lung's social media. That's quite O O C, right? But even some influencers tend to keep their partner as privacy. Michelle could have treated it as a similar way. So this clue was still being kept open for consideration. On the other hand, Barrett. The guy Michelle's aunt married to told the police that Michelle often went to parties, bars, and drank, and she also used online dating apps to meet new people. While he was like implying that Michelle had been kind of promiscuous and was, you know, one of those social active people. So now Michelle's description was very different from that of her family members, and thus. Newly added uncle Barrett. The police tried to retrace Michelle's steps before she went missing. They found one of Michelle's classmates at the UTS. This classmate last saw Michelle on Thursday, the twenty-first of April, around three p.m. at the entrance of the university's main building. Michelle was waiting at a bus stop at the entrance. Getting ready to go shopping at the Meyer, a shopping mall in the city center. 
The police then obtained video footage of Michelle's activities in the area on the 21st of April. At 3 p.m., Michelle was indeed seen inside the mall. At 10 to 4 p.m., Michelle entered the St. James subway station in the city center. Then 40 minutes later, at half past 4 p.m., Michelle arrived at Kamsi subway station near her home. The evening, only Michelle and her aunt's husband, Barrett, were at home. Michelle's male cousin had gone back to China a few months earlier because of his visa and had then returned to Australia. And her female cousin was staying out overnight that day. A little after 10 p.m., Michelle talked to her aunt who was working a night shift somewhere else. Michelle's last message was sent around midnight to an IELTS teacher in which the teacher agreed to have Michelle as her assistant. After that, no one able to get in touch with Michelle Lung. On the 22nd of April, at noon, Michelle's aunt made several phone calls to her, but no one answered. Later, the aunt told the police that she thought since those three days happened to be a public holidays in Australia, Michelle might have been out having a good time and didn't hear the phone, so she wasn't too worried at first at the time. As Michelle was still chatting with her aunt in the evening, literally a couple of hours earlier. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the 22nd, Michelle's cousin, whom was having a night out, came back home and saw Michelle's slippers at the doorsteps, which suggested that Michelle might have briefly come home and then left again. So no one was suspecting a thing on 22nd. Yet. After that, the police checked the civilian footage near Michelle's home and used the location of Michelle's mobile phone signal to figure out that from the evening of the 21st of April, when she came home until the 24th of April, when she was found dead, she didn't leave the house. It's likely that her home was where she died. The police then carefully checked the civilians along the road from Michelle's home to the place where the body was found and made a significant discovery. Surveillance footage from Mamara Lake National Park showed a suspicious car in the early morning of the 24th of April. Upon investigation, they found out that this car belonged to Michelle's aunt's hubby, Barrett. Also, signals from Barrett's phone were detected near the blowhole where the body was found. You see, Barrett acted way too suspicious. From the different opinions against Michelle to the cell phone signals, the police had to conduct a thorough investigation of him. On the 29th of June 2016, the trial of the Michelle Lung case commenced at the Parramatta District Court. During this trial, the prosecution constructed the whole process of Barrett's crime based on a bunch of evidence and witness testimonies discovered by the police. Before the incident, Barrett had these sexual fantasies about Michelle and wanted to hook up with her, which he totally admitted in court. He had secretly set up two tiny cameras in the bathroom to secretly record Michelle while she was taking a bath. Additionally, do you remember when I mentioned that Michelle's aunt had a daughter and a son from her previous marriage, who were also living under the same roof with her young husband Barrett? Barrett would often sneak in both Michelle's and his stepdaughter's rooms in the middle of the night to take photos and video of them sleeping. Then he'd jerk to these materials. And it was proven to be true as the police recovered his phone. In April 2016, Barrett seemed like he couldn't suppress his urge of doing something really bad, I bet. He attacked and killed Michelle. He had planned it all out, knowing that his wife and stepdaughter will be out of town from the 21st of April to the 24th, which conveniently fell on a long weekend. 
and his stepson was in China at the time. So basically, it would be just him and Michelle at home during those days. It was just past the midnight of the 22nd of April. He broke into Michelle's room and knocked her out. He stripped her and tied her wrists and ankles with some sort of waterproof tapes. He tied it so tightly that under the binding of the tape, Michelle's skin quickly became congested and swollen. And he wasn't done yet. He gagged her with a cloth. Then he took a while to admire his handiwork with a bending gaze, as if appreciating a piece of art. He finally took 19 photos of her being tied up and struggled with pain and tears with his cell phone. All the evidence was recovered from his phone when he was arrested. However, at the time, the police could not find any other recording devices or additional evidence to prove that Barrett had sexually violated Michelle, and the deal denied a sexual violation at court. But after the photos were taken from his phone, the prosecutors believed that Barrett killed Michelle in the next two days of captivity at some point. With 30 plus stab wounds and multiple injuries, Michelle passed away. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, while Barrett was subjecting Michelle to horrific torment, he was suddenly interrupted by the sound of a key turning in the door lock. It was Michelle's female cousin, who also happened to be Barrett's stepdaughter, coming back home. In her court testimony, she mentioned that she had been at home for a little over three hours that afternoon of the 22nd. Meanwhile, Barrett stayed hidden in a bathroom with the shower running and occasionally going back and forth between his bathroom and the bathroom. At one point, she needed shampoo from that main bathroom that occupied by her stepdad, so she knocked on the bathroom door. Her stepfather partially opened the door and handed her the shampoo. And he mentioned that the bathroom had an unpleasant odor and suggested she use the other one. She found it a bit odd though, it's her stepdad, right? I guess she wasn't too close to this dude though, she wouldn't assume he's the evil and all. So she kind of just let this afternoon slip out of her mind until she was questioned by the police. Now that we look at this testimony, Barrett could be in the middle of managing Michelle's body in the bathroom when his stepdaughter came to knock the door. When the sun was about to come out on the 24th, Barrett packaged Michelle's body and drove two hours to this blowhole in Monroe State Conservation to dump the body. Afterwards, he went to his parents' house, which was only nine kilometers away from Spit Junction, and soon returned to Kempsey. On the evening of the 24th, Michelle's aunt finally returned home and found the house was unusually clean. When the aunt grew anxious because she couldn't reach her knees, Barrett reassured her that Michelle had simply hung out with friends. It wasn't until the afternoon of the 25th when the aunt insisted that Barrett accompanied her to the police station to file a missing person report. They then had several hearings for Barrett. Barrett came up with the excuses, saying that he was not in his right mind because of drugs. But with the evidence the prosecution gathered already, Barrett was facing a total of 22 charges, including the murder charge, 19 counts of filming private areas without permission, and two counts of having pornography material. During the court proceedings, the prosecutor presented the autopsy report which revealed that the defendant had exhibited extreme cruelty towards the victim. The victim had endured immense pain and fear leading up to her death. The fatal step wound had already completely penetrated her neck, indicating the use of a sharp blade approximately 2 cm wide. The defendant had taken great care in cleaning up the crime scene, which explains the absence of biological evidence like DNA. As a result, 
The murder weapon has yet to be discovered by the police. Barrett totally owned up to these crimes and straight up admitting that after brutally killing Michelle, he kept her body hidden at home for a solid two days before ditching it, thinking he could have gotten away with it. When the prosecutor greeted him, he kept on saying in court that he had taken a mix of crystal and weed right before he murdered Michelle. And Barrett claimed he took drugs mainly for two reasons, while more absurd excuses he created. First, the lack of intimacy with his wife for an extended time, and second, unemployment left him feeling depressed. Yes, this do blame it all to his wife. And I think I didn't mention is that this Barrett worked in some IT department, but he left his work after he married Michelle's aunt. To me, he seems like a male gold digger because he married someone much older, but he was attracted to younger women. That's why he would sneak glances at Michelle and his stepdaughter. He said he spent at least over a thousand Australian dollars on drugs every week. When questioned where he got the money from, Barry said, "Coded, my wife is a prostitute and drug dealer." Barrett said. He killed Michelle under the influence of drugs and did not remember what happened during those two days between her murder and the disposal of her body. All he could recall was being in a hazy state of mind after taking drugs. Michelle's anguished face and the blood in the bathroom sink. He said that because he had previously watched a bunch of Asian pornographic materials, he had sexual fantasies about Michelle and his stepdaughter, and coped with the crystal he took that day. He was in an uncontrollable state and had lost his memory. His defense lawyer also argued that his client was on meth when he committed the crime, and that he had trouble fitting in with people. However, the prosecutor argued that. The suspect had already finished using meth three weeks before committing the crime, and his testimony on this was inconsistent. Additionally, Barrett was caught on civilian footage appearing very calm and sober when he stopped to refuel and bought several drinks on the way to dispose of the body. Psychiatrist Dr. Richard Furst also testified in court that meth usually. Doesn't cause memory loss, especially not at the levels Barrett claimed to have used. From the moment he got arrested, to the murder, to the disposal of the cops, his intentions were very clear, and he was in a completely sober state. Later, the prosecutor said that the defendant recording the crime scene could be seen as him doing it to watch it again later in future, and he took. Great pleasure out of it. So they suggested to the court that this type of sexual and violent crime has a higher possibility of reoffending in the future. Through several separate trials over more than a year, Barrett repeatedly confessed and wept. He said, "Quoted, what I have done is irreparable, and I deserve to be punished. I promised to take care of her." But I betrayed both of our families. I didn't want to kill anyone. I hope to have a family and kids. I can't believe I took a life. I hate myself so much. At the same time, he also said he was not suitable to be locked up in prison because he would be labelled as a paedophile and had nearly been killed in prison. <laughs> so he didn't think of this when he committed the crime, right? Moreover. Throughout the whole trial, Michelle's mom was there in the audience. Well, can you imagine how tortured it must have been for her to hear the killer spew all these messed up excuses for what he did to her only child? Then, on the fifteenth of December, twenty seventeen, Barrett has been sentenced to forty six years in prison, with no possibility of parole for. Thirty-four years and six months. That's before the USB drive I mentioned in the beginning of the video. 
possible even after the contents of that fast drive were submitted, which confirmed Barrett's guilt of sexual abuse of Michelle Lung. Barrett was sentenced to 20 years in prison for the sexual assault charges, but this will be served concurrently with his current 46-year sentence, which means Barrett had been given an additional two years for a total of 48 years in prison, and he will be eligible to apply for parole in 2052. Barrett, born in 1989, could potentially walk out of prison at the age of 63. Couples with a significant age difference are quite uncommon. And Michelle's aunt and Barrett, this couple with a substantial age gap, generated a lot of buzz after the whole incident occurred. Michelle's mom had to set the record straight on some mean rumors about her sister. Some folks thought that it was one of those marriage of convenience or business marriages where Michelle's aunt married Barrett just to move to Australia, which caused a bunch of problems. Others found Michelle's aunt's behavior and testimony suspicious, and there were suspicions of shielding her husband, Barrett, since she reported Michelle's missing only three days after she disappeared. Michelle's mom had to stand out and tell the media, quoted, actually, it was him who totally fooled us. My sister and I are pretty gullible, so we bought into everything he said. He said, Michelle's just out and she'll be back in a jiffy. Michelle's out with some dude. He completely misled us. And for a long time, we actually believed it was some other guy. He made an illusion. He placed Michelle's slippers at the door. Michelle's mother said, on the 22nd, he killed Michelle. He also took photos. Then he backed the body and moved it to his truck. She could have been alive during the meantime. We don't know. On Sunday, the 24th, he disposed of the body. Then he picked up my sister at night and had dinner and drinks with their friends, showing no signs of anything strange. As for why they reported the case three days later, Michelle's mom told the reporter, quoted, During the public holiday, many locals went to the southern mountain to see the red leaves, and there was no cell phone signals in that area. He kept telling us, Michelle must be out with her friends. We will definitely come back. And my sister didn't think negatively, believing that she had gone to see these that lives with her friends. Regarding the claim that Michelle's aunt and Barrett had a marriage of convenience, Michelle's mom expressed anger and said they were planning to sue the media outlet spreading such false information. She told the reporter, my sister has a Hong Kong passport and it's very easy for her to travel to and from Australia. There's no need for a marriage of convenience. If it was to obtain residency, why didn't they help me or Michelle? Michelle came over to Australia when they already registered for their marriage. My sister and Barrett has been together for almost six or seven years. Since 2009, Michelle's aunt and Barrett began a romantic relationship. If it was a marriage of convenience, they could have divorced after two years of obtaining this residency. Why haven't they divorced yet? This kind of rumor has caused us a lot of pain. If it wasn't for this report, we wouldn't even know what this marriage of convenience means. Behind these speculations may be some netizens' doubts. Barrett had been harboring evil intentions towards Michelle all along. How could she not notice it and move out? But here's the thing. Barrett wasn't just half evil attention towards Michelle. He also had it with his stepdaughter. His previous filming and masturbation were all done furtively, or when they were all asleep. 
so no one had ever noticed it. In Michelle's modest ways, he had concealed it too deeply. Quoted, "Both my sister and I are deceived by him. Usually, we all live together as a family, and there were no signs at all that he was a pervert. Looking back now, he was just a two-faced person. Privately, one side of him was very perverted and terrifying, while in front of others, he tried his best to disguise himself as a polite and courteous person." He had never touched or fondled my daughter before. My daughter, my sister, and I were kept in frequent communication and talked about everything. If he ever had any indecent move, Michelle would have told us long ago. He concealed it too deeply. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you like my video, well, you can show some support. By liking the video and subscribing to my channel, I will see you in my next video. Bye. And I am dressing these traditional Han Chinese clothes. Is it pretty? I think so. Just that I don't know how to, um,、mm, how to tie my hair to a style that fit this outfit. Well, anyway. Hope you also like it like I do.